Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome again. Welcome to this session on uh, decarbonization of road transport in Africa, science, technology, and uh, innovations and policy. Uh, Sophia, if you could please project uh, the slides. Uh, my name is Moses Ogutu, and I'm an associate program officer with the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I also we also work with the what is called the Interacademy Partnership. We'll be telling you more about it uh, in a few seconds. Uh, and I'm here together with um, uh, our such our uh, with Sophia, who is also, who is our associate uh, research. Um, unfortunately, most of our speakers weren't able to make it to be here in person due to a variety of reasons. Uh, but I can guarantee you that they are a very terrific lineup and they are gonna be sharing a lot of insights about uh, what's happening in Africa's uh, transport uh, sector when it comes to the transition to net zero. Um, one second. Okay. Uh, so, where is the IP? Okay. Uh, people are coming in, so I want them to sit down. Welcome, everybody. So, the, as I mentioned, the session was organized uh, by the IIP in collaboration with the one of our regional networks, the Network of African Science Academies. Uh, the Interacademy Partnership, uh, we are a global network of some 150 academies of sciences, engineering, and medicine. Uh, the, the way the IP functions is that we, we represent uh, over 150 science academies. In addition to those academies, we also have four regional networks uh, in Africa. Uh, we have the Network of African Science Academies. Um, in the Americas, we have uh, the, uh, the IANAS, the Inter-American Network of Academies of Sciences. We also have a European Academies Advisory Council, EASAC. Uh, and we also have representation in uh, Asia Stock Pacific with the Association of Academies and Societies in Asia, ASA. Uh, we work together with those academies to and networks to provide independent expert advice uh, on scientific and technological uh, as well as health issues. Uh, we have two offices. Uh, in the US, we are hosted by the National Academies of Sciences right here in DC. Um, and one of our offices is with the World Academy of Sciences, TWAS, in Trieste, uh, Italy. Uh, the study that we are about to share with you about uh, today, uh, which, will, which also informs uh, part of our conversation, it's, it's, it's designed in the way the IEP works, where we do regional studies in different regions. So this is the second in a series of studies. Uh, the first study was done by the uh, our European network in 2019, and it explored uh, how to decarbonize the transport sector in Europe more broadly. So this second study focused on Africa. Uh, in, the, in the future, we anticipate doing studies in Asia as well as South America. So after we have done the regional studies, then we normally do what we call a, glo a global synthesis uh, report, where now we compare what's happening in different regions to provide more like a global outlook um, and policy on the report. I mean, on the topic. Uh, next, please, Sophia. Next slide. Uh, well, uh, in the panel today, we have Pinas Buisson, who is the chair of the Internet of Things at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, for those ones who just joined us, they're joining virtually, so I'm the only one here. And then we have Dr. Mafini Dosso, who is the founder of uh, OITID in Cote d'Ivoire and is an economist in matters innovation um, in Africa. And we also have Ms. Irene Karani, who's a climate researcher and has done a lot of work advisory and policy-wise at the national, regional, and interna international level. And then we have uh, Ahmed Osama, who's uh, from the Center of Mobility Research in Egypt. Uh, both of them will be sharing with us about the work they do, um, as well as, so this is part of the committee that wrote this report. We had a working group of about uh, 10 members. 
um, and they's, they volunteered to be here with us today. And for those of you who just joined us, I am Moses Ogutu um, with the uh, program officer with the National Academy of Sciences, and I'm going to be moderating the session. Um, over the last three, is it three years or four years now, since 2021, 20, 20, uh, the IAP and the Network of African Science Academies have been developing a report looking at uh, what would it take to decarbonize the transport sector in Africa, more specifically the road sector. So this study explored opportunities, challenges, as well as the policy uh, options. And I'm not gonna bore you with a very long uh, PowerPoint presentation at this time of the evening. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna provide uh, go through some quick highlights that will then inform our conversation today. Next slide, please. Uh, if you want to scan and download the report to follow through, feel free to use the QR code. Now, um, what is the current role of the transport sector in uh, global emissions? And what is Africa's position in those emissions? I think the conventional wisdom, which we already know, is that uh, developing countries or emerging economies, including those in Africa, uh, we are the least contributors when it comes to carbon emissions. And so the same is true even within uh, the transport sector. Now, the transport sector in general contributes uh, almost a quarter of the CO2 emissions globally. And Africa is really a very small contributor to that. Uh, some Saharan Africa's emissions have remained significantly lower compared to all regions over the years. Um, and if you look at the average CO2 emissions per person in Africa, is only 0 0.8 tons. Now compare that to the global average of 4.8 tons. Um, so we still remain uh, the lowest emitters compared to any region, all the other regions. And when you, when you look at the road transport sector specifically, if you try to compare which countries are emitting the largest emissions, uh, so these emissions remain low, but the truth is that they are rising and they are rising very fast, even compared to the rate in which other regions uh, grew uh, historically. Um, the, if you look at countries like Egypt, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Libya, Morocco, those five countries are actually responsible for uh, the 70% of Africa's emissions within the transport sector. But the main reason is also because they're also the countries that have the highest rates of motorizations, including vehicle ownership. Now, this is a very important point because the rapid rate of motorization in African cities, uh, of course, we know the result of that is chronic, tra chronic traffic congestion, high levels of pollution, and the associated uh, economic and health imp impacts. And emissions generally, in addition to the high levels of motorization that is rising, there's also, if you also consider things like um, increasing urbanization and uh, rural urban migration, which of course leads to urbanization growth and people are buying more cars, of course, income levels are also increasing. And so there's a lot of activities that are happening that means that Africa's emissions, not only within the transport sector, but more generally, are expected to increase in the coming years. So this makes it imperative to also, when you talk about emissions, also think about decarbonizing the transport sector. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when you talk about decarbonizing the transport sector, what we find is that uh, there's already efforts happening in terms of reducing emissions within the transport sector in Africa. A lot of countries have adopted uh, policies and regulation that aligned, and most of these policies align with uh, the nationally determined contributions as, as part of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, we've got um, countries adopting or locally manufacturing 
electric vehicles. Uh, there's also efforts to convert existing gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles. And some of the panelists that we have are gonna be talking about their work in that sector. There's high usage of renewable ele re electricity, including solar. Actually, interestingly, there's many countries in Africa, including Kenya, where I think 93% of the national electricity is renewable because of the high usage of uh, most of the electricity there comes from geothermal before you even think about uh, solar. So a lot of this renewable electricity is being adopted and used within the continent. Uh, when it comes to with the adoption of EVs, of course, comes the challenge of like, if we decarbonize the sector using electric vehicles, uh, do we have elect do we have en enough electricity? Can we be able to support the transmission, the distribution? So there's different efforts of balancing and mixing between solar charging stations, um, developing innovations like battery swapping uh, to address issues like range anxiety. But even more importantly, there's things like uh, implementation of non-motorized non transport strategies and infrastructures. MMT, here we are talking about uh, bicycle lanes, uh, walking, etc. I mean, not to say that we weren't doing this before even these terminologies were conceptualized. African countries, I think in, in a typical African country, walking actually constitutes the largest form of transportation in both rural and urban areas. If you've ever been to many urban African capitals, you would notice a lot of people are walking. But what countries are doing is that they're coming up with ways to formalize, uh, build the accompanying infrastructure, uh, think about things like addressing safety issues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is uh, one good visualization of uh, when we talk about, we're talking about local assembly and manufacturing of buses. African countries have historically been assembling uh, vehicles, uh, and we've got strong industries in places like South Africa, places like Kenya, that have historically uh, bought materials and equipments from uh, Asia or other countries, and then assembling them together into uh, buses. As for example, but now what they're doing now, they are now building these electric buses in places like Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, Nigeria, and there's so many companies that are innovating within that sector. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, we've seen cases, I think even here in the United States, where there's people converting uh, some form of uh, the gasoline vehicles into electric. I think so far, my experience in the U.S. setting, what we've seen is that people are converting their um, luxury, luxurious automobiles so that at least they can be part of the EV revolution, right? In places like Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, what is actually happening, actually we're taking vehicles like these and they're being made into electric. And the interesting part of this is that it is not just the conversion, actual research is being done to measure energy needs, range, range, the ranges it can move, uh, uh, the charging behavior, when, and, and these, are actually, these are the vehicles used for public transportation. So there's a lot of work going into this effort, and this is very useful in the aspect of circular economy. Uh, and I think one of our panelists will be speaking more about this as well. Um, the same is on the, on the motorcycle side. Uh, most, of, most, most transport in Africa uh, the what we call two wheelers, motorcycles, and three wheelers, the tricycles and your tuk tuks are also being made into electric, and they they are also the most widely used uh, modes of transport for navigating both uh, rough roads in the urban areas as well as difficult terrains in the rural settings. So there's a lot of all these activities that are happening as part of the transition to net zero transport in the African continent. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we're trying to show here is that there's different ways to address stuff like range anxiety, um, where which is basically the fear of running out of power. We've seen cases where people maybe people's perception and attitudes towards electric vehicles. There's a lot of debate what, of what will happen if I run out of power, right? Now, in the African context, we are used to being out of power. So we are thinking, we are already thinking, how are we going to address this? We might not be able to develop enough charging station, but are there ways we can use our, 
a deep knowledge of how we've always dealt with issues of power challenges in the past. So uh, next slide, please. So there's these solar charging stations and including things like pulling extra battery that are happening. Um, since most transport, since most transport decarbonization focuses on electrification, um, before I even comment on this slide, where we, what we, what the working group that developed our study made a clarity on is that uh, electrification of decarbonization of transport is not synonymous to electrification of transport. Because when you think about decarbonization, we're thinking about a holistic approach to uh, reducing carbon emissions. And that could be within the transport sector or more broadly, all sectors of the economy. But even within the transport sector, when you think about decarbonizing transport, we shouldn't necessarily be focusing only on electric vehicles. Uh, we need a holistic approach that looks into uh, what is the type of energy being used even within the existing uh, transportation system. Uh, we need to think about uh, accessible infrastructure. We need to think about things like equity. We need to think about things like, um, well, walking as well. But uh, when it comes to ish, when it comes to electrification of transport, uh, there's a big challenge in terms of uh, what that would mean to the existing grid system. And uh, do we have enough power? Uh, do we not have enough capacity for generation? Uh, what, what does the transmission system look like? And even what does the distribution system uh, looks like? If we don't think about uh, this, this is where range anxiety comes in and then consumers become nervous about purchasing electric vehicles, uh, for instance. And of course, from the, from the map or the chart there, you can see that electricity access in Africa it's as a share of population is still very, very low within the continent and even within the various countries. So uh, these are some important issues to address. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we find that one of the most or the classical framework for decarbonizing the transport sector has been the enable, avoid, shift, improve um, approach. Uh, for the purposes of this study, we thought, we thought it important to include the aspect of resilience. So we've technically expanded this approach to make it an acid approach. Um, what this what these frameworks talk about is that uh, the enabling the enable aspect focuses on establishing the enabling framework, the foundational and governance laws, uh, and this could in include institutions, financial arrangements, all those policies that are necessary for a society to function. And they, those one will be critical. That's where our policies comes in when you think about decarbonizing uh, the transport sector. There's the aspect of avoid, which focuses on reducing the, the need for and the distances of travel, um, primarily through better urban planning and the adoption, for example, in recent times, remote work practices, but even more so, even with compact uh, land usage, where instead of uh, you building like this compact or, or cities where you can easily walk to your grocery store to pick up your kid in the school nearby, thereby reducing the need for motorized transportation. Uh, where if you talk about the shifting part, encourages the same way uh, moving travel demand from, for example, individualized cars to walking or uh, mass rapid transit like uh, buses, uh, metros, trains, et cetera. While the aspect of improving, uh, we're talking about uh, enhancing the efficiency and the, and the performance of the existing transport system. This could be through better vehicle, uh, uh, net zero fuel like hydrogen, or even uh, looking at how the network is designed and operates. Now, as I mentioned, we added this resilience com component because uh, these days there's no debate about climate that goes on without us talking about the resiliency of the system. Um, and so this is also crucial within the transportation sector. And so we need to, to, to be thinking about how, uh, how do we enhance the resilience and adaptive capacity of the existing transport infrastructure to withstand um, extreme environmental uh, challenges like the one we've, we are experiencing. I mean, just recently 
in a couple of weeks or months ago, you've seen how flooding has devastated, uh, affected some of the roads and bridges in countries in East Africa. A couple of years back in, 20, in 2018 and 19, countries in Southern Africa like uh, Durban, Mozambique, uh, even hinterland countries like Zimbabwe that have no access to sea, floods all the way passing through Mozambique and coming all the way to Zimbabwe and damaging crops and infrastructure. And uh, in places like the US or maybe in Europe, but I think the best case is in Australia, where in 2018, um, extreme, extreme heat led to the melting of asphalt on the roads. So it's just important that now we start thinking about uh, when talking about the resiliency. So that makes it necessary to include this as part of this uh, strategic framework. Um, next slide, please. So this would be a summary of the key findings of the report, many of which I have already uh, talked about. Um, uh, perhaps the one that I haven't talked about is like what you see in number six, uh, when it comes to uh, adopting or thinking about electric vehicles in transportation, uh, we found that this report, the working group found that targeting high mileage extensively used vehicle segments would be crucial in uh, EV adoption. Uh, and it's also important to think about the transport, a, a broader integrated sustainable transport strategy that includes mass rapid transport like the like the BRT buses and metros and unmotorized uh, transportation. What we find is that of course, there's the usual challenges like uh, finance is a big challenge for doing all this work, uh, but perhaps even the more bigger challenge when it comes to many transitions to sustainability is the aspect of industry resistance. How do you manage the existing, the existing dominant and the entrenched uh, systems. So uh, this is a conversation. I uh, will invite the uh, the panel to uh, present on some of the work they have done in this area, and then we'll have a chance to also uh, answer. I mean, invite into the conversation to speak about some of the questions uh, you may have. Uh, I think as a first panelist, I'd like to invite um, uh, Professor Thinas uh, Buisen. Uh, I think you can give him the chance to maybe share his screen if he has a slide. Um, yeah, Pinas, if you're ready. Oh, I am ready. Thank you very much, Moses, and thank you for that yeah. introduction. I'll quickly share a few slides, um, and I'll, I'll try to do so uh, very briefly. I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'll, I'll share some of the context of us um, retrofitting a, a minibus taxi which is one of the main modes of transport in South Africa. So we took a, a Toyota minibus taxi, as you can see on the screen there, it's a 2009 year model. And the premise of this project was really that um, we have many of these vehicles in the region. South Africa alone has more than 250,000 of them. And they're responsible for over 70% of uh, daily mobility in the region. And rather than buy a whole new uh, electric minibus taxi, which is uh, slightly difficult to get hold of, first of all, but then um, rather than do that, we decided to retrofit this vehicle. And what you see on the right hand side is the retrofitted vehicle, which is fully electric. And I'll show you just a few slides on um, that process. So these are two of the minibus taxis that we stripped down. We took out the engine, took out the gearbox, took out the uh, the petrol tank. And what we installed was, um, as you can see here, we replaced, the, we removed the engine. What we installed is an electric motor and control electronics and a very big battery. This here is the high voltage rack, the low voltage rack, and they went into the old engine compartment. And underneath the vehicle driving directly into the differential, uh, we installed a 90 kilowatt motor, um, which is driven by a battery and the battery is mounted in the back of the vehicle. You could also mount it at the bottom. Um, and this battery gives us a range of approximately 120 uh, kilometers. It's a 50, uh, 54 kilowatt battery. Uh, we used lithium iron phosphate batteries just to ensure that there's a, a non-volatile battery used. And as you can see, there are quite a bit of um, battery management system installed there. In terms of running cost, uh, if you compare it to petrol or diesel, uh, the petrol running cost is approximately uh, $16 per 100 kilometer. 
the diesel approximately fifteen dollars. And if you look at a new minibus taxi, so this is something that you import from China at the moment, um, you can pay as little as four dollars per hundred kilometers, and the retrofit is six dollars. But what is important is that this retrofit is substantially cheaper than the um, the brand new electric vehicle, mostly because of import duties and shipping duties. And using a retrofit uh, pays off within thirty thousand kilometers, um, which is substantially faster than uh, than you would. Uh, for a new electric vehicle. Um, one of the big challenges that we had was we had to make this vehicle roadworthy. And to get full roadworthiness, we had to keep the weight of the vehicle exactly the same. And we couldn't change anything. We couldn't drill or weld into the chassis uh, to ensure the safety. And this is officially the first uh, recognized and registered electric minibus taxi in, in South Africa. Um, there's a link here if you want to go and have a look. Um, we also imported a brand new Haiga uh, minibus taxi, which is basically a Toyota high ace knockoff. Um, and we compared uh, these two in terms of the performance and the cost, the power, the battery, the weight, etc. Uh, importantly, the brand new vehicle is not yet road certified in South Africa, uh, mostly because the weight is, is so high that the braking tests weren't valid. Um, with which the vehicle was delivered. But um, as you can see, there's a there's a comparison that you can go and have a look at uh, if you want it. And then just to compare um, just quickly the range of the vehicles, and this is why we do a lot of research on this topic, uh, looking at the range that you can achieve with a diesel vehicle versus a petrol versus an EV taxi. Um, these modes of transport are, are transport is used throughout sub-Saharan Africa, and they typically have to travel 250 kilometers a day. And then over weekends, they easily do uh, 2,400 kilometers um, in, in a matter of 48 hours. So there's really a substantial challenge with regards to range. But then also just refilling the vehicles with energy, as it were, is much faster if you fill diesel or petrol. Um, you can fill it to the equivalent of 300 to 400 kilometers per minute of filling gas. And with electric, the limit is only three kilometers per minute. So there's a big challenge in the operational space here in sub-Saharan Africa to cater for the low charging rate of these vehicles. Uh, just in terms of replacing the current petrol and diesel fuel tanks in filling stations, um, as you can see, uh, the equivalent energy that's stored in those filling stations can give you approximately 225 kilometers on a diesel vehicle, slightly less on a petrol vehicle, but then if you replace it with stationary battery storage, it only get of the same size. It only gives you approximately 16,000 kilometers. So a lot of the research that we do is about trying to optimize operations, trying to understand how this nebulous and um, spontaneous mode of transport that's so unique to the region, how it will survive if it were to be converted to electric and how we can facilitate the process while at the meantime, um, while well, we try to uh, protect the grid. And a lot of this is covered in the report as well, where we describe some of the challenges and some of the opportunities of doing that. Thanks, Moses. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ines. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Maffini uh, to speak more, more to the role of uh, innovative technologies and innovation policy more generally uh, in this process. And perhaps maybe comment on, uh, in addition to this retrofitting, what African innovators are doing in the area of e-mobility. Thank Mofi. you very much, Moses. Good evening or good afternoon to everybody uh, and uh, to my uh, fellow writers of the report. And again, always a pleasure to see uh, Tinus advances uh, on the research ground uh, in the transportation sector. Congratulations again to your team. And uh, just... To start, I would like to say that if you take the lenses, the lenses of uh, innovation, it is clear that decarbonization of transport is not only about transport, simply because you have cross-sectoral industrial dynamic that are occurring, meaning that innovation in one sector would feed also innovation in the transportation sector. So that's the first thing. The second thing we also observe is that different actors of African innovation ecosystem, including large firms, including startups, but also uh, universities, uh, as it was just shown, and also government, are adapting and deploying uh, emerging technologies, foreign technologies, and innovative business model 
to address the issues of uh, sustainable transportation. And those, uh, let's say, actors are already changing the game on our path towards sustainable transportation. The first thing is that when you look at the innovation, you see that they are very localized in their creation, but also in the diffusion. They are localized at the geographical level. They are localized also at the spatial level within a same geography, let's say, and they are also localized, socially speaking. And that's why inclusivity matter in the way we actually innovate. Uh, Moses and Tinos mentioned a lot of this innovation, including the battery enabled uh, uh, solutions, including also the mass, uh, mass rapid transit or bus rapid transit, but also uh, transportation, intelligent transportation. Uh, we also noticed that there's an issue of scale. The ability of the innovative actor to scale their solution is also a critical issue. Now, what they do is that they leverage the technologies, but they also leverage innovative business model. And what they do, they leverage these different solutions in order to address critical challenge in the sector of transportation, including to alleviate the to reduce the carbon emission, to alleviate the externalities, but also to improve the reliability, the efficiency, the affordability, and as well as the uh, accessibility of infrastructure and the variety of transportation mode. If you look, if you focus only on the startup part of the ecosystem, the estimation by Britter Bridge suggests that there are about 500 transport and logistics startups operating on the continent. Looking funding wise in terms of what is announced, in meaning in terms of what is known in terms of venture capital that has been uh, fueled to, toward the continent, we see that transport and logistics amounts more or less 1.4 billion of US dollars. So that makes this sector the third most attractive in terms of startup funding in the continent, in the African continent. So carrying this innovation, those startups are actually responding to core SDG re relating, for example, to ELF, SDG3, relating also to SDG11, for example, sustainable communities, cities, and, uh, and uh, region. They are also addressing, of course, uh, the SDG number nine in terms of innovation and infrastructure. Then beyond the transport, because of the solution that they bring into our ecosystem, they indirectly addressed critical challenges related to water, to education, but also to, uh, to uh, energy and of course to the climate. Now, that, what does it mean for our innovation policies regarding decarbonization of transport uh, on the continent, at least the innovation part? It means that we have to be ambitious. The ambitious comes also with the amount of funding we are able to bring in. And Moses also underlined the importance of financial framework. We have to be experimental because look at the rate of adoption or the rate of diffusion of technologies in Africa may not be the same uh, and, and, and might also be different across uh, if we add the, the sectoral uh, perspective. They have to be also uh, mixed in terms of bottom up and top down solution coming together to address the, the let's say, the most extensive or the more intensive uh, uh, user segment. And they have to be anticipatory and also uh, inclusive. Now, they have to be inclusive because exactly they have to target the part of the population where uh, there's some evidence about mass transit and evidence about uh, uh, more intensive use. So I would like just to uh, stop on this part and, uh, and uh, add that it is also important without giving any detail that uh, our startup and our decision makers have data about the innovation pattern uh, in the transport and logistics sector, about the diffusion of innovation and of technologies, and of course, uh, uh, related data infrastructure to support the integration of new solutions, as well as infrastructure actually to make this uh, innovation uh, uh, real, really touch the, the ground. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Mafini. Uh, what a highlight of on uh, the role of innovation and in, uh, in uh, the transition to net zero transport uh, generally. Um, uh, Ahmed, uh, if I may ask you to, could you please uh, comment more on uh, the enable avoid uh, 
shift improve resilience approach in transportation. Um, and even more so in terms of your work uh, in the decarbonizing the transport sector in the Egyptian setting. Sure, uh, allow me to share the screen. Um, you can see it right now. So, uh, hi everyone. Thank you, Moses, and thank you, uh, and a big thank you for my colleagues uh, from the uh, report. So uh, I'm, I'm going to first give a, a very quick brief about this uh, void shift improve strategy. Um, so uh, basically, the void shift improve is a strategy that starts with actually reducing the need to mobilize travel. Um, and then goes into shifting into more environmentally friendly modes like uh, walking, like cycling. Uh, there are scooters now, which I don't like a bit due to safety issues, but anyways. And then we have the improve uh, strategy, which is improving the technology and improve energy efficiency for transportation modes like electric vehicles. Uh, like using renewable energy and you know, that stuff. Um, avoid mainly, the, we, we have two main aspects, transportation demand management, uh, through carpooling, through post variabilization, uh, any strategies intended to actually influence the demand for travel. And we have on the other side, transportation supply management through intelligent transportation systems, uh, and other and other ways in order to make actually um, uh, the supply more efficient and uh, actually the effect of the motorized mode of transportation uh, the negative effect is less. Um, there have been a lot of transportation demand management measures worldwide. Uh, unfortunately, in Africa. Um, uh, there have been no actually um, um, uh, there have been ideas but they are not implemented or I would say not efficiently implemented. You can find that Europe have most of the of the uh, voice strategy with 238 low emission zones, seven congestion charging zones and one vehicle restriction. Uh, I believe this is need to be a bit updated because I believe now it's it's more for Africa there is Still, there is, there is, I believe, a solid implementation of transportation demand measures. In Egypt, for example, we had this study for low emission zones, but it had been a study. It was never implemented. Then if we go to the shift, the importance of the shift actually a strategy goes actually from this figure. You can see here the importance of walking and the importance of public transit Although, of course, the speed is different and the time for the, tra the travel time is, is lower than, than cars at, at many instances, but you can find how huge uh, the capacity of, for example, mass transit um, and if it is electrical, how this would be much more sustainable, of course, than using um, uh, vehicles. Um, I see images. Um, again, um, there have been a lot of uh, plans, sustainable urban mobility plans in Europe, and uh, there are some in Asia, some in uh, in North America. Um, again, Europe has most of the of the sustainable urban mobility plans, which which focus on on shift uh, to non motorized modes of transportation and. Uh, public transit, but again, Africa is actually lagging in the efforts of uh, shifting to non-motorized modes of transportation and public transit. In Egypt, we had some efforts. We had the first sustainable urban mobility plan in Egypt, uh, I would say, uh, two or three years ago. Uh, it's, it's still not implemented, and I will talk about that in the conclusion. We need this enabling a factor to be added to the avoid shift input. We had some actually BRT project and uh, bike uh, sh sharing projects I also, but again, they, have, they are suffering from a lot of challenges. 
improve strategy focus on improving the technology through promotion of electric mobility, for example, um, uh, which needs uh, some government incentives and, of course, has a lot of challenges regarding charging infrastructures, especially in some countries in Africa or most of countries in Africa. It needs an education awareness about its importance and about the industrial challenges. One of the other aspects of improved strategy is the investment in renewable energy because without renewable energy, again, okay, you may be reducing the emissions, but you are using maybe uh, fossil fuels to run your uh, electric plants. Um, many of the many there are, there are many countries who have uh, like plans for uh, uh, cutting ICE vehicles. By so, for example, United UK it has a plan to cut uh, ICE by 2040, um, and other countries. Again, in Africa, this is still uh, under development. Uh, in Egypt, we had this. Uh, sorry, we had this electric mobility strategy, and we had suggested some plans, uh, roadmaps, in order to. Um, shift to electric vehicles. But again, um, shifting to electric vehicles is not the only solution. And actually avoid shift improve, although it looks good, but there are two main aspects that Moses mentioned that we need to add. First is the enabling, which is before the avoid. And what we mean by enabling is that to have the governance framework in order to actually implement the avoid and shift improve strategies. So for example, in many African countries, there are um, uh, some shift strategies that are implemented, some improved strategies that are implemented, but there is no comprehensive plan and there is no governance framework for implementation and for following. This is one aspect that is important. The other aspect is that is important is resilience. Um, Africa uh, has a lot of challenges, and even worldwide, there are a lot of technology, uh, 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 technological um, uh, fast uh, paces, so which we need to be adapted to. So resilience to these um, technology improvements is actually very important, especially in the African context. In Egypt, for, like. Uh, 10 years ago or, or less, we didn't have Uber and there is no Uber actually, but now Uber is everywhere in Egypt and we need to look into that while we are discussing shifting to public transit and how it would affect it and when we discuss non motorized modes of transportation and how this would affect it. In conclusion, most road to transport emissions is increasing significantly. Um, although there have been few efforts, but Africa still trailed the other regions in mitigation measures. Um, avoid shift improved strategies can have a significant impact on transport CO2 emissions, but in Africa, we need to tune this approach to have this enabling aspect and this resilience aspect. And I believe it's not only about Africa, but also worldwide. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Ahmed. Um, so I think from the conversation, what we're seeing is that uh, there's a lot of uh, policies that are required. There's a lot of uh, cross-cutting issues uh, that uh, provide both opportunities, but even more so challenges that uh, public policy and governments have to deal with. Uh, I'm going to now invite Miss um, Irene Karani, uh, who's done a lot of work in supporting uh, development of climate policy, uh, both at the national level in Kenya, uh, across the Africa region, and even internationally. Uh, Irene, could you speak more to some of the most crucial cross-cutting issues uh, that we need to be aware of uh, while transitioning to this net zero transport? And even more so, uh, how should we approach them? or how are we dealing with them in the context within which you uh, worked in? Yes, thank you very much, Moses. Um, so I'll delve into two main cross-cutting issues, environmental issues and social issues. The softer sort of issues that are 
people usually ignore uh, because the, you can't really touch them, but they are very, very important when we are transitioning uh, the transport system into net zero. So starting with the environmental issues, you find that whilst, you know, uh, stopping the use of fossil fuel, you know, uh, driven cars and transitioning into electrical cars is going to uh, have a lot of environmental benefits, but we need to think about the entire value chain. For example, where, you know, there are a lot of critical minerals, minerals that are going to be used to make the batteries. We'll need cobalt and lithium. Cobalt is meant to, the use of cobalt is meant to triple in the next uh, 20 years or so. Lithi and triple lithium is meant to double. And where are these minerals found? And you will find that for cobalt, for instance, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, has 70% of the global output of cobalt that will be needed to make the transition into, um, into net zero, you know, through the because of the use of batteries. Now, how the cobalt is extracted, the communities that are there when it is being extracted. All these factors need to be taken into consideration. And then if we look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, it has the second largest rainforest in the world after the Amazon. So it is a major carbon sink. So if we are going to um, need cobalt in order for this transition to happen, we need to think of also, what are we going to do in mitigating the emissions that will come, for instance, if you have to mine it from the ground, you know, trees will need to be cut. So there are, there are trade-offs that we will need to think about. So environmental impact assessments, uh, engaging with the communities on the ground to ensure that they are not disenfranchised or, you know, taken out of their, of, of where they live for this to happen. All these considerations need to be taken into account. And even after extraction, how do we restore and rehabilitate the area um, so that we don't leave gaping holes in the ground? So these are issues that are quite pertinent, but people tend to sort of think about the end product and not like, you know, where, where the, 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 the production of it uh, right from the ground, especially when it comes to critical minerals. So that so 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 we need to think of the whole value chain and have a systemic approach as to how we are transiting, you know, transitioning into net zero. The second aspect I want to discuss is um, it needs to be a just transition, and a just transition has to put the people at the center of the transition. Um, the people, for instance, in the fossil fuel industry, uh, whether it is in, in the extraction of the oil and gas or, or, or in the industries uh, that use fossil fuels, um, either to make cars or whatever it is, you know, they have livelihoods. Now, if we close down those industries as is happening as we move towards renewables, these people have livelihoods. They, they need to put food on the table. What do we do with them? What do we do with these people? Um, because you can't just, you know, uh, leave them high and dry. So there is need to think about safeguard their rights, the workers' rights. Uh, there will be job losses, but how do we reskill them? And they, if they can't get reskilled, how then? Do we have a social safety net for the ones who can get reskilled? You know, into new industries, EV industry, um, into other industries that we, that require renewable energy. So you need to work. The governments need to work with the private sector and the labor union so that there is no social unrest when you disenfranchise hundreds of thousands of people who, for instance, have been in the coal uh, industry. So, so that is, um, that is 
another issue that we really need to think of and be aware of uh, so that we don't cause problems when we are trying to fix uh, another problem. The third, the third issue is st the stakeholders, because um, there are many stakeholders, the private sector is a stakeholder, the government is a stakeholder, and the people who are vulnerable are also stakeholders, especially women, uh, people with disabilities, and there are issues of equity and inclusion in a transition. And um, a lot of these people uh, who are vulnerable have also been left out of the current transport system uh, because either they can't afford it and most of them walk or they are unable to access it uh, completely. So as we transition, there is an opportunity, you know, to, when we are restructuring the infrastructure to ensure that, for instance, you know, you create ramps for, for the people with disabilities, for women, you know, their safety is ensured um, so that they get to, to take up the new uh, infrastructure and transport facilities. And, and, and to make sure that also areas where maybe the transport system never reached before and is reaching now probably, like people in the deeply in, in the rural areas, they also get to access um, you know, the system in with, in with equal measure. So there are, so we need to think of how to include the these people, the vulnerable, the people with disabilities, people who are unable to access the transport system before, how can they do it now? And inbuild that into the infrastructure. Uh, and this can only be done through stakeholder and really inclusive stakeholder participation that ensures that, that equity and justice and uh, inclusion of all is, is done fairly. Thank you very much, Moses. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Irene. So we have like uh, some 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions in the room and a few as well uh, online. Okay, you can uh, go next, sir. Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh... My name is Fabio Ribeiro. I'm from Purdue University. So I give you some preamble first before I ask my question. So someone in Africa was, was asked uh, uh, what Africa is doing for energy transition. So the answer was, well, first we need energy. Then uh, we'll think about the uh, transition, right? So what I want to say is that energy is critical to improve the quality of life, right? There's a direct co correlation between energy and uh, quality of, of life. Now, as uh, Irene just pointed out, there is a great opportunity uh, to use the unique capabilities of Africa. The energy transition is, maybe it will give the opportunity for the different parts of people in the world for the first time, not use fossil fuels, but use their own resources. There is technology now that could be used and could give Africa, uh, because the capabilities you have, unique capabilities of solar, wind, uh, you mentioned the uh, the unique materials you have, and, and I'm sure you have it even much more there. So my question is, is what are you doing in that front to use this uh, energy transition really to improve quality in general uh, uh, in Africa? Like uh, Irene mentioned the, uh, the points. Um, who wants to take that? Irene, uh, maybe Irene, you want to comment on that? Yes, I can. I can give it a try. Um, so as 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 rightly said, there is a problem of energy access in Africa completely. Um, you know, the number that is always quoted is like 600 million people still don't have access to basic energy uh, in Africa. And there are, there is, you know, there have been efforts to increase the access, especially of renewable energy across Africa, but it is not easy uh, because it does require a lot of investment and finance for renewable sources, whether it's wind or, or solar, um, or geothermal or 
you know, whatever it is. And whilst, and now the, the issue that has been there and why we are not moving as quickly as we need to move is that African governments, you know, a lot of them currently are under debt distress um, because of various reasons. Uh, you know, there have been shocks to the economic systems of many countries in Africa. Uh, COVID was a shock, you know, the never ending droughts and flood cycles are also a shock. And this is decimating, you know, the amount of of, uh, of finance that they have for for basically transition, so there 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 is need to um, to support uh, the countries in very you know using various financing mechanisms in order for them to even harness the renewable energy that they have in order to provide uh, access to their people. So whilst and this, this finance is not coming as quickly, probably, and in the shape that it needs to come. So you find African countries have more loans that they are unable to pay, and some are already defaulting on, 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 on their sovereign debt. So this is an issue we are grappling with. Um, and hence the clamor, you know, like, during the UNFCCC uh, COPS of why there needs to be financial restructuring uh, for African countries. But everybody is trying what they can uh, because if there is no energy, then you, you can't transition. You have to be transitioning from something to another. And if, if there is none, uh, and also another narrative that we are trying to push in Africa is if you, your economy is not yet fully fossil fuel dependent, then instead of going fossil fuel, the fossil fuel way, you can transition into the green renewable energy way from the beginning, instead of getting trapped in the fossil fuel and then you have to undo everything and then go into the so it will be easier for african countries once they get the finances to transition into a renewable pathway a green economy faster than some of the global north countries um, have done before let me leave it there Mark. yeah I mean, uh, yeah yeah exactly yeah go directly to to the uh, uh, renewable energy, yes. But uh, how can we help? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, that's a good question. How can you help? Um, is the point for the next conversation after the session. Um, but maybe uh, I'll invite Ahmed. Did you have the same comment on that? Um, I think if, uh, if I also may add to Irene, um, Okay, we, we have the problems of, um, for example, the COVID, the flu, and all that stuff. And there are also these financial also distress. Uh, we cannot actually deny that. Um, we, we need also in to take in consideration the governance and the importance of governance and frameworks in order to... Um, uh, make things go faster in Africa, either for for uh, energy access to everyone and energy access for the projects, or for the decarbonization uh, efforts. In, in in Africa, governance is really important, and we have a lot of challenges regarding governance. Um, I would say, for example, in Egypt, we had uh, mega public transit projects, but these mega public transit projects are being implemented, but there are challenges in operation and challenges in even implementing this project because there is no strong governance and as there is no, I would say, governance that had the authority to actually to operate and to think and to um, put creative ideas and to implement. African countries have a, have a lot of uh, potential and have a lot of actually uh, human resources. But again, and always this governance issue and the policy frameworks 
make make things hard. So how how you can help? I think uh, capacity building uh, can be one of the ways of support. Um, this, this is one of the ways of many ways of, of support or help. Uh, thanks so much, Ahmed. Uh, is there another question in the room? Uh, we'll take uh, you and then her. Uh, okay, hi, everyone. My name is Joan, Joan Chimese, and I'm a PhD student at UCLA. Well, this is actually out of my forte because I do paleoecology, paleoclimatology, but I'm actually from Nigeria. And this affected me firsthand because I spent like 24, hour, um, 24 years in Nigeria. So my question is, how do you advise people in a city like Lagos? So who has been to Lagos before? Lagos is the smallest, but most populated city in Nigeria but it has the worst roads <laughs> and people tend to get less than five hours of electricity a day. So how do you advise people in this, living in this city? Lagos is not a rural area. <laughs> it has a lot of beautiful places. But the problem they have is just the bad roads. So how do you advise people here on decarbonization of um, transportation? Because for example, the way Uber works here, you want to go to a place, you book an Uber, you know how much you pay. But in Nigeria, it gives you a range. So you actually do not know how much you're going to pay because of the traffic. So you see how you could actually see um, how long you spend in traffic. You can't know how long you spend in traffic. Not because you have too many people, but because the roads are bad. So how would you um, convince people that and, um, adding to this carbon footprint because they want to, how would you advise them on decarbonization? That's just my question. A uh, very interesting question, and I can relate. Uh, I mean, all of us, we I'm from Kenya, and the speakers are on the African space. Some of these things, I think they also experienced them. But um, I'll uh, give it to one of the panelists, whoever feels cut to answer this question about consumer, uh, consumer behavior and uh, response. Uh, Thinas, you wanna? Have some comment on that? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. I can. I can make it. Maybe make a start, Moses. I think one of the things that became clear as we did the report, and one of the things that we highlight as well, is that the fundamental and primary push towards decarbonization in a developing region such as sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of Africa actually is probably going to be a financial one, in which. It makes financial sense and it should make financial sense to decarbonize and to move towards cleaner fuel technologies. Um, because I think you touched on this topic earlier, or maybe Mafini did, is that if, if people need to eat, if people need to eat and, and have a, a roof over their houses, decarbonization is not their first priority, right? But fortunately, what we are seeing is that cleaner technologies are becoming cheaper and a lot of um, financial support is flowing into the region to decarbonize. Um, the question is whether that finance or those finances are managed well and whether it's directed adequately into the right um, directions. But um, like I said, I think the primary push should be a financial one that, that makes sense for the consumer and for um, service providers. Um, if, if, if I may add to this, um... So I think we also, uh, as Moses mentioned, we need to uh, to extend the scope of the urbanization into an unauthorized transport. And actually, um, yeah, yeah, there's there is this financial distress, but um, there are also a lot of opportunities. Um, so um, uh, it it may not be applicable to different cities in Africa, but for example, in in, in Cairo. Um, Cairo is 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 a is is a very walkable city. Uh, however, we have a lot of motorized usage. Uh, we have a lot of usage of motorized mode of transportation. Why is that? Because there is no this holistic strategy that we need to apply the shift, which is uh, shifting to non-motorized modes of transportation and public transit, along with improving the technology like electric vehicles and so on, so on, so on. 
So I have this opportunity and we have been, okay, we have been pushing towards electric vehicles, but we have an opportunity in our hand, which is non-motorized mode of transportation. If we invested well in bike sharing, in bike lanes, uh, this is less expensive and have uh, much impact on decarbonization than uh, electric vehicles, I would say. Uh, thanks so much, Ahmed. I'll take a question from mom over there. Oh, you, yes. Hi, thank you. Sandra Barrow, Smart Cities World, based in London. Uh, Moses, originally, when you started talking, you were mentioning this industry resistance and financial limitations that occur um, in terms of getting things done and changed. Um, I feel like I've heard a lot about the problem uh, and what's happening what's not happening or what's happening that's that's challenging, but I'd really love to hear some examples. For example, regarding industry resistance, what's being done that you could talk about that you know would guide us to maybe replicate it in other African cities. Uh, I work with cities for a living and I think a lot of a lot of these problems are happening, such as in Lagos and um, uh, throughout Kenya, et cetera. So I, I I'd love to hear some examples of the good that's being done or what we could take away from this meeting rather than just a discussion of the problems. Thank you. A very good point. Um, Irene, do you want to comment on that? I'll try. Um, industry resistance is, is, uh, is, is real uh, because the players in the fossil fuel industry, you know, have quite a lot of funds uh, to ensure that the government uh, sort of encourages them <laughs> to uh, to keep the fossil fuel industry going. Uh, but we have seen quite a number of uh, incentives that have been provided by government to, to encourage them to shift away from fossil fuels. So there are examples like, um, you know, tax incentives where, you know, governments are zero rating, like the import of parts, you know, solar parts or even EV vehicles. I mean, even EVs where the VAT is, is sort of waived for a particular period of time to encourage people to move away from, um, from fossil fuel vehicles. So there are examples, you know, in Kenya and in South Africa and, and the, the government is, and once the government provides, and it's not only tax, uh, tax incentives, there are also other uh, fiscal incentives then you find the industry starts shifting slowly by slowly. But it is not easy, and the government has to sustain the incentives for quite a long time, um, and not like dilly-dally. So maybe this year in the financial bill, you find there are tax incentives that are taken away next year. That cannot work. But as, as, as the tax incentives or the other fiscal incentives are put forward, they have to be sustained. And <clears throat> for African governments to, to sustain, you know, where they are seeing that they can get money to run their governments year in and year out, that is also an uphill task. So there are, there are some examples that are happening, but probably they will need to be sustained and they will also need, um, they will also need, you know, more players on the ground to to keep them going. Yeah, um, we can invite the one raised hand that has been in the uh, chat for long. Uh, what I want to comment about the question about the good examples, I think there's a lot of countries. Uh, Rwanda is Rwanda is one country I know where they have a specific rate for charging electric vehicles, for instance, which is way, way lower. I can't remember the figure, uh, but they actually make it easier for you to get to, in terms of the cost you use to charge. 
uh, in addition to all these incentives that we are talking about, uh, governments are giving uh, forms of support to like the EV assemblies and manufacturing. Uh, but perhaps another good example that I think, uh, if you look at the adoption of the bus rapid transit, the BRTs in Kenya, uh, it has been stalled for a couple of years now because of, uh, of course, the industry resistance. And here we aren't even talking about the fossil fuel industry. We're just talking about uh, the challenge of who will operate the BRT transport. Uh, um, but uh, now that's different because when I was a student in South Africa, uh, I wrote a paper about, um, I mean, so the, the buses exist. There's all these activities like forming cooperatives, and then the buses are being owned by the same same operators that have always been operating the other transportation. But then they come together and say, because as a consumer, all I want is efficient transportation. I don't really care who's owning it. Uh, so in South Africa, we have that example whereby we've got different cooperatives owning and managing uh, different routes. I think this is more common in uh, in Johannesburg. So there are, there are all of these efforts happening that are transitioning us towards uh, that process. Um, before we finish, uh, there's a question online that I want to take. Uh, Mikhail, could you please uh, unmute and ask your question? If you are still there. Yeah, thank you. So my questions are how do we um create awareness and mobilize youth to, to create awareness for for the transition and decarbonization of of the transport sector? Then second um during my my uh, during during my campaign because i started a, a go green campaign and during that period I, I targeted the rural area what i realized was that um some of these alternate alternate energy some of these um clean energies like solar and biogas and all of those things they, they are quite expensive in in this region and the region that I targeted, and I was I was not able to create to create the awareness. I was not able to 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 bring in the people that are living in the rural areas to 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 sensitize them on on the use of of fossil fuel and and still um and let them know the the, the advantages of of transitioning to to the alternative energy source too. And for the EV, I think some of these EV companies, especially here in Nigeria, they are so expensive that people can't afford it. Say the middle and the, and the low income class can't afford some of these EVs. And I think one of the problems that we still have again is that there's no access to, to, to energy. There's no access to to the to power supply so these are some challenges that we faced during this period and so i'm asking if they, they, there's going to be financing to transition to 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 clean energies and if there's going to be subsidiaries for EVs, for ev for for people that are going to to be buying ev if there, if there, there's any subsidiary for them Thank you, thank you, Mikhail. Quite an interesting question about the cost of EVs. Uh, Mafini, uh, can I please ask you to comment on that? And also, we are running out of time, so maybe uh, just briefly. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me well. The network is not so good today. It's good. Um, Regarding the awareness creation, I mean, that's what we do uh, with my NGO in the field of innovation. So I do understand that, especially when we talk about emerging technologies or systems that are not too ready, uh, it means that the four elites should be involved in the awareness raising because each of them will have a job to do, meaning the civil society. And we see, uh, we report some of them in the report that local agencies or local kind of non-profit are now taking over the, the topic and are organizing different type of events and different type of initiative to raise awareness. So civil society is starting, resources are also missing in this field. 
the government role is also important, but also the education part is really important. So we need to talk about this issue all along the educational path of these young people and also to demonstrate if we want to raise the interest that there are job opportunities. Because currently, when they look at the transport, they see it as an old sector. If we quit all the Uber and the young part that has provided uh, uh, some kind of uh, 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 of uh, working, let's say, uh, um, uh, opportunities to the youth. But this means that raising awareness would be uh, very gradual. Now, what I want to say is that sometimes people kind of overestimate the rate of diffusion of technologies. So it depends on the maturity of the technology itself, but also depends on the context in which this technology is taking place. So there are resistances, of course, but also the time the system needs to learn and to integrate that there might be benefits over certain costs, uh, this will take time. So it won't be in one day, the transition. Uh, that's what he called the transition. But uh, the, the, the partnership across different actors will change the game. And definitely, as Irene mentioned, the incentive, but more especially the sustainability of these incentives are also uh, very important, uh, time-wise speaking, of course. Uh, thank you so much, Irene. Before I say thank you to the online uh, team, uh, just note that uh, so we have uh, we have uh, the IP. We have an exhibition table. After when you're doing the rounds, uh, we can come talk more about the study and uh, other our work in climate change. Uh, for everybody, thank you so much for joining us, uh, especially to our panelists. Uh, where they are is either. 9, 10, or 11 p.m. And they have endured to be with us here today. So thank you so much all, and uh, we appreciate it.